So this is part two of today's seminar. And I was going to look at this a few weeks ago, but I didn't get around to it. But one thing that we do, what we have been mentioning in some of the other seminars recently is bricks. Um, when we look at the construction of Roman sites or we look at, we, we, today we, we looked at um, bricks as well, relating back um, 9,000 years ago. We, we, a few weeks ago, we looked at Samaria and so on and so on. So bricks are really interesting bits of archeological evidence. Now, when we think about bricks, bricks can be sun-baked, they can be air-dried, they can be kiln baked, you name it, you can do all sorts with bricks. Brick, historical background, is a well known building material used in many parts of the world, usually when stone isn't available or when timber isn't available. In some regions, brick was first used over 2000 years ago. In other parts of the world, we got the use of bricks 9000 years ago. Relatively recently, we're still using bricks today. It, so it, it's, it's been with us. It's a, it's a staple of our history. Essentially, brick is clay, which has been fired, heated to a temperature sufficiently high to com convert it to a hard, durable substance. But what you're seeing is air dried bricks in front of you. Reference has already been made um, to clay unfired bricks that we that we mention sun sun drying bricks and the origin of brick making we could say goes way back now we could say the origin of fired bricks goes back um five maybe six thousand years but we've got examples of fired bricks in regards to the Indus culture that we've done very, very recently. That takes us back to four and a half thousand years ago when we looked at the Indus Valley so recently. And that technique of fired bricks runs into the Sumerian world, and the world between the Tigris and the Euphrates, the Assyrians of Babylon and so on and so on. And brick making spreads into um, India, throughout Asia, and goes all the way over into China, where, whether, whether brick making is influenced by the likes of our Indus Valley in different parts of the world, we don't know. So there you go, Harappa bricks, the fire bricks. And these are your sun dried bricks from the Euphrates region, Mesopotamia, Iraq, and that type of landscape. A brick. An Indus Valley brick. Do you know what? I, I, I've got a little collection of bricks. You know, there's brick societies. And there's, there's pages on the internet of people who just look at bricks. My brick is four inches long. What type of brick is this? Um, I wouldn't take the mickey because um, I, I, I do have a fascination for the things. So the earliest... The earliest structures so far found which has been interpreted Sorry, as I missed that. I've got Siri talking to me look Please. look Siri right yes no just no just go away okay thank you did you see Siri interrupted my lecture then unbelievable so we, we've got bricks and we know that they're being fired as far as four and a half thousand years ago but some of the first evidence of brick kilns, actually, we found the brick kilns dates from a place known as Lathal, which is part of the Indus world dating to back to 4000 years ago. So we've actually got brick kilns being found, which is absolutely great. Um, it, it's saying that this is described as a, a clamp kiln, which is going to be set into the ground, an enclosed kiln. And we've got advances in kiln technology with, with updraft kilns, which means that there's an updraft into the kiln. And that means that the bricks are being fired at a very, very high temperature using lower amounts of material in the furnace to actually heat up the bricks. So here we go. 
temperatures, we do believe that in early brick kilns, temperatures might have actually managed to get to a thousand degrees C fairly early on, a thousand degrees C. Because what's happening, you've got this kiln, uh, you've got an updraft kiln, so it drags air into the kiln and there's an updraft, cold air being heated, there's an updraft. You don't need as much material as fuel that's going to cr create intense heat and that's going to create the bricks that are going to be everlasting at a thousand degrees C. So let's look at a couple more images. Bricks. It, it, here we go. Again, going back to what we've already mentioned, the first brick makers mix soil, clay and water to make squishy mud. Next, they squash the mud into a, a wooden mold, which was, which was the shape of a brick. I love this. Mud bricks could dry in the hot sun, but it was better to put them inside a kiln. The fire in the kiln heated or fired the bricks at a high temperature, making them hard and durable and lasting a long period of time. One reason why I wanted to mention this was the description at the bottom. All Indus Valley bricks were the same ratio of one, two, four. We mentioned that in the lecture. Yeah, that's, that's basically giving you dimensions. But and but uh, came in different sizes. So we, we've got a ratio there, but came in different sizes. And I'm, I'm really struggling to understand what that means. A common size was seven centimeters high, 14 centimeters wide by 28 centimeters long. So the uh, I see what you mean. The, the ratios can, the ratios are one to four. So you could have 14 centimeters high, and then you double that to 28 centimeters wide. And then you um, then you increase the the length accordingly. That's going to be fifty six centimeters in, le in length. So the ratio is the same, um, but the size is a difference. So yeah, I understand that now. Bricks were laid in rows or courses, end to end and crossways, using wet mud as cement to stick the bricks together. Now. We do know that bitumen has actually been used as well. So um, when we start to get into, say, the Roman period, we've got cement and so on and all the rest of it. And that's another story. But we're talking about bricks. Now, one thing I learned years ago was the bonds in regards to the construction of walls. Now, we're going to look at a lot, lot more about this next week. So with this, with this as a backdrop, just a few things about the importance of bricks. So the importance of bricks may have been responsible for the development of great cities. Bricks were fairly rudimentary and easy to make. And as long as you fired them, you could make a big towns and walls quite rapidly, as long as you've got the workforce to be able to create. Um, the bricks in the first place. Now, bricks themselves could be used to create patterns, could be coloured, could be glazed, to could be glazed to such an effect that when you look at the Ishtar Gate at Babylon, um, at the palace of Neg uh, Nebuchadnezzar, dating to around 604 to 562 years BC, the, the great palace of Nebuchadnezzar, the, the, the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar. This, you had wonderful, ornate, glazed bricks. Um, and this is a technique that was so sophisticated that we do believe that, that it evolved um, with the, the palace and the gateways and the walls of Nebuchadnezzar over 2,500 years ago. Um, and then, then we, then when we think, we sort of move on a little bit more. And again, um, I wanted to do this a little bit more justice. So what we're going to do, we're going to do the Roman stuff next week. Um, but what I'd like to say, by around 300 years BC, the Greeks uh, are using bricks, and they're actually using brick tiles for their roofs. So there you go. We've got brick tiles being used for the roofs even by that stage. In due course, the craft of brick make making spread to various parts of Europe, including 
the Etruscan civilization in Tuscany around around by at least around around the same time that the brick making technology is advancing in Greece. And obviously you've got you've got the extensive use of brick by the Roman uh, Republic, the Roman Kingdom, and then eventually the Roman Empire. So more about that next week. I don't want to rush that. It, it would seem a little bit of a shame. So in regards to modern building, you've got stretcher bond, where you've got the side of the brick, not the head of the brick, but the side of the brick is stretching. Um, and then where you've got the Flemish bond, where you've got header bricks and stretcher bricks, where you've got the length of the brick um, with the head of the brick creating what's referred to as a Flemish bond. And then you've got the English bond, which is a mix mixture of uh, bricks that stretch and header bricks. So that's the English bond. But I, I, I was looking at my notes and thinking, well, here we go. We've got English bond, English cross bond, Dutch bond, Flemish bond, header bond, Flemish garden bond, Sussex bond, English garden bond, facing bond, Yorkshire flying bond, monk bond, and so on and so on. We don't need to know about all that, but look at that, some designs that you can create with bricks. Bricks are massively important. They're, 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 they're undervalued in archaeology. They really, really are. And I, I, I mentioned this story before. It's a nice little story. We, we used to have a coordinator for our Wrexham branch years ago. We used to have a Wrexham branch for Archaeology Cymru. And she was called Nancy Rosenberg. She ended up being a great archaeologist and uh, um, she's been on TV and everything. And one day me and Nancy Rosenberg, we were in Shrewsbury and we were looking at the walls and we were having a bit of a conversation about the date of these walls. So because the walls were crumbling, we would both grab a little bit of the crumbled and we would put it in our mouth and we would crunch on it. And um, we would be talking about the age of the wall. And strangely enough, um, we had a group of tourists gather behind us and there was a tour guide seeing, look at, and, and, we, and we stopped, we were stopped in our tracks and we said, look what archaeologists do to our built up heritage. They actually eat the walls. And she was really firm. Stop damaging the walls of our, of our town, she was saying, really embarrassing in front of us, this group. And we're having a great time, actually. We had a good old laugh after that. But brick itself, over different periods, actually has a different taste. Roman bricks have a different taste to medieval bricks, and, and medieval bricks have a different taste to some modern bricks. Believe me, it's true. That's why I've really got crap teeth. Looking at that again, the bonds corpus. Um, you can see what one that would be familiar to you all is herringbone. And lacing course. Now, the Romans would have a habit of building walls using the lacing course tile, um, style, the one in the bottom right hand corner, in regards to their forts. Because what you would see, you would have these, you'd have these big bricks these brick, big bricks, which would go through the, the, the um, width of the wall. And above, you might have random stone sort of faced. You might have hewn stones or whatever, but usually what you would see is something like that laser course down at the bottom right. We'll look at that a little bit more next week. And herringbone, well, archeologists use herringbone, have used herringbone in the past to indicate on an archaeological site, which is the reconstructed walls. Um, and then you might have the walls underneath the, the actual, the original walls. Herringbone, yep. We see that herringbone is used to indicate reconstructed walls at Tinkinswood Burial Chamber and actually St. Peter's Church in the Vale of Morgan. But herringbone is also typically used by, in Anglo-Saxon building of churches across Britain, we see 50 plus churches in Britain that are of Anglo-Saxon build and there's another 200 that are bits of Anglo-Saxon stonework in them and you often see the herringbone style. And um, oh am I going to pick on anybody? No. The, the most intriguing bit of the brick is the frog. Glazed over yet? The frog. 
Now, the frog itself, if I can um, get my little, if nobody knows where a frog is on a brick, it's this. Now, the frog itself is where you would have a stamp or where you would, that, that's, that's basically the frog. And the frog itself is, is, in, is an assistant to the bonding way that we construct the wall. So being, being somebody that's actually worked as a building laborer, we were used to this. So you'd have the, the um, bricklayer. Yeah, he would lay his cement in the frog and it would overlap the frog. And that, and then you'd have another brick on top of that, and and the frog itself would act to hold um, the the cement in place whilst you're building the wall. That's basically what the frog is. It's also it's it's also to sort of reduce the use of clay when you're making bricks, but we don't talk about that. Um, and again, I tell you what, right. Type into the internet brick bonds and you, you'll be able to look a little bit more for next week. Um, and you'll be able to learn a bit more. Look at that. There's, there's an old brick. Now, weirdly enough, in, in some buildings on new estates, they go into, they, they've started making bricks like this again because they look, they look in vogue and they look fashionable, but they're not very strong bricks. And the adage is, me and me and um, oh god, me and Richard mentioned this that we got lots of houses going up around Barry, and they'll probably be down in fifty and sixty years, and the house that Rich is living in now will probably be still up at the same period of time. And uh, now, what what you can what you can see clearly there is that there's a frog inside. Sometimes that's a maker's mark, or there's a stamp in it. All brick works around Barry had a stamp. Caniston brick works. Um, Brock Quarry Brickworks, all these different names that, that we have. And usually there's a standard with bricks. Uh, the, and, and one other thing I'll just chuck in there, if we don't mention this week, next week, all mines, well, most mines, I would say, most coal mines made their own bricks. So the house that we're living in uses the... Oh God, what's the name of that um, mine down by um, uh, Toronto Rev Oil, Michelle? What's the name of it? Coy Dealey. Coy Dealey, yeah. Our house is actually made out of Coy Dealey bricks, but the, the, this, the, the Coy Dealey was actually a, um, a coal mine. And basically, whilst, whilst they're developing the coal mine, they come across seams of clay. And to make money, to build the mine in the first place, they make bricks and they would stamp it with the Coid Ely stamp. And with all excess clay, they would stamp it with the Coid Ely stamp. So all mines in Britain, coal mines as an extra income would make bricks. I'm saying all, I would say most actually. And there's a frog. So the bit in the middle is called a frog. So we, we're looking, we're looking at the construction of a wall. And if you, if you want to put up a rapid wall, somebody, as, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm quite confident I would still be able to build a brick wall, even after 20 years. And you can, you can clearly see this is Flemish bond. This is quite a strong, powerful wall. And next week, what we're going to be looking at is Roman brick. And we'll look at medieval brick next week, and we'll look at Tudor brick. And I, um, I, I wrote to some, I, I wrote to somebody once, and I said, I'm thinking of building a house using bricks that have been salvaged from buildings in the Low Country. And the guy sent me samples of bricks in the post. It was great. I think, still think I've got those bricks. But um, that's what we're doing next week. We're looking at um, Roman bricks, and look at that. That's a whole building on the Appian um, Antica way into Rome. And look at that, it's a building completely made out of bricks and it's still standing today. Bricks themselves, a building um, using well-fired bricks uh, at a very high temperature, 90, 850, maybe a thousand degrees, no more than about a thousand degrees because the bricks melt. And what we do find in regards to uh, Roman 
uh, brick making. There's lots of kilns everywhere. This was on one actually discovered in Germany uh, at Augsburg in Germany. This is a brick kiln and bricks themselves, as I said, were in were very important in the building of the Roman Empire. And look at that. That's um, Pergamon, the red basil basilica Pergamon in in southwestern Turkey, near Ephesus. Now look at that, it's still standing. I'll tell you what, wouldn't it be great if they actually, you know, they, they put beams in there you and put a roof on it? That would look absolutely fabulous, wouldn't it? It would be, look great. I think that building over on the left is either a Coptic um, Greek Orthodox church or something, and, or it, it's actually a mosque or what have you, but bricks. That's what we're doing next week. And we, we, we finished that today. So what I'd like to do, is ask, are there any questions, please? Ellen? No, sorry. Jessica? No, I thought it was quite good. Learned something new, so. Good, go. bricks. It's good to learn about bricks. bricks. Bricks are the foundation of humanity and Richard's house, other than what is uh, Mrs. Lobs of brick Bricker in. Right, Richard? No, I'm all. Bricked out. Satisfied with that. Yeah. Okay. It's good being, isn't it good being satisfied with a brick? Um, Anne? Yes, it was very interesting. And there, there's a star brick works in Killian. <laughs> so, oh, wow. You've been doing your research. Okay. More. I don't, I don't think they're Roman, but. Um, oh, no, no, not really. And Bill's going to tell me that he's got some mice egg bricks. Um, oh, I have, Carl. What, well, Bill? There is actually a thriving brick society in the country. And whenever we, we ramble the hills, uh, a local guy here, I know, says, if you find any unusual bricks, bring it down to me, because there are many brickworks totally disappeared. Yeah. And we found bricks with names like the Kinhordi Brick Company. Where was that? The Eagle Brick Company. Where was that? The Argoid Brick Company, so it's, it's amazing. And one other thing about the strength of um, a brick wall, it's not only the cement bond which makes it strong, but as the cement actually dries, the moisture leaches out and causes a partial vacuum inside and pulls the whole thing tighter together. And that, that, that gives the, uh, the wall much greater strength as well. Oh, right. It's a drying process which actually gives the strength of the wall. Mm. Oh, well, well like, yeah. And <laughs> something there, and yet you're right. All the names that you've you've mentioned, the Argoid and so on, it, they're they're actually names of, of coal mines. So where where you've got where you've got a brick name is actually a coal mine. Yeah, all, all the mud came when they actually sunk sunk a uh, mine, which is an incredible civil engineering project. You're talking about digging a hole in the ground half a mile deep by about 20, 30 foot wide, mm -hmm. and the amount of uh, mud which came from that. Ideal, sorry, clay rather, ideal for actually making bricks. So you're quite right. Mm -hmm. It's the sinking of the shaft was the uh, main reason for producing their own uh, their own bricks because the, there was a ready supply of clay as they went down and down. Yeah, exactly, Bill, exactly. So on that note, um, I'm going to thank you very much for joining me tonight. And we've got one more next week before we break up. Uh, for Christmas because the following week we'll have broken up on the Wednesday so we'll have missed the Thursday evening lecture um, and then um, a little bit more detail coming up so if there's no other questions uh, this is my week done I'm throwing in a towel and I will see you all next week okay. see, you, see you Richard and Anne and Jessica and Ellen and, and Bill fail. next week and, thank uh, you and Jess, I will speak to you tomorrow take care thank you very much okay. oh, oh, I've I've told Monty and he says he's going to come. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> text him. <laughs> text him. Oh, all bye, right, bye, bye. Well, that's bye, it. Bye, bye. 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 So I don't know what to say. To, I'll I'll just tell it. I'll just have a chat to him. Yeah, go on then. Bye. Bye.